Welcome to the By Way of Commandment podcast, a podcast dedicated to the study of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the finer points of his doctrine. Join us as we study the gospel through the scriptures and standard works of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Welcome back, everyone, to the By Way of Commandment podcast. My name is Jacob Ryder. I'm your host. And today, I want to be looking at faith, the concept of faith. What does it mean to actually have faith or to, say, to actually believe in God? Um, I have a few scriptures that I want to talk about, but also a few video clips. So this is going to be a little bit different. I, I normally just read out some um, talks, but today I actually want to play the clips of them and see how this goes. Um, so bear with me as we do this for the first time on the podcast. But I want to share a couple different video clips. Um, the first being from a psychologist, a lecturer uh, by the name of Jordan Peterson. Now, he's become quite famous in recent years and somewhat of a polarizing figure. Um, there are many people who absolutely love him and people who really do not like him at all. And uh, regardless of your politics or um, what you feel about the man, uh, I want to pull up a clip of his from one of his lectures a few years ago. Because I think some of the arguments he makes and some of the things that he says in this particular uh, lecture are very profound and important for us to understand as Christians and Latter-day Saints um, and believers in God. And then uh, I'll share another little clip from another talk from Elder David A. Bednar um, and read a few scriptures in conjunction uh, with these talks. But it all comes back to the question, what does it mean to believe in God? What does it mean to actually have faith? So I want to I want to go here first. This is uh, Jordan Peterson and a talk or a lecture that he gave a few years ago called "Who Dares Says He Believes in God." So I'm going to play this clip. It's a uh, about ten minutes long or so. Uh, I probably won't play the whole thing, but I do want to hit on um, quite a bit of it because I think he makes some important um, points here. Now, the context of this, he was in Australia at the time, and he had been on a few different um, news stations and, and television programs in which the question came up, do you believe in God? And for years, uh, Jordan Peterson has not really answered that question, or at least not answered it in a very clear way in which uh, listeners get a sense of what he really believes. And he goes on to say that he doesn't really like that question. He doesn't, um, he doesn't know what it really means. And so in this, this particular lecture, he spends a great deal of time kind of explaining his thought process between, behind um, what he thinks, in his own opinion, it means to believe in God. And I think he says some things that are pretty uh, profound and uh, important for us to think about. So I'm going to play this clip, and uh, I'll, I might uh, stop it intermittently throughout the clip and kind of add my own um, little two cents to it. Um, and here we go. Young, they've kind of become stock, which is not a good thing. But, um, but they're the best approximate. I, I, I can't figure out why I don't like the question exactly. I've got three, I had three sort of burgeoning hypotheses. One was, it's none of your damn business. That's the first one. So it was like a privacy issue. Like it seemed to me to be a question that was too private to be answered properly. So right off the bat, he mentions that he has really three reasons why he doesn't like the question, do you believe in God? Uh, this first one, um, pardon the little bit of language there, but uh, he believes that faith is a, a very personal matter and is maybe, at, at least in his eyes, not something that we just go around professing, but something that is deeply personal um, within our own lives. And so what we believe and um, our, the, prof the profession of our belief is something that is meant to be taken very personally. And so in some sense, in his own mind, um, he doesn't like answering the question, what do you believe or do you believe in God? Because he sees it as a, a fundamentally personal issue. Um, and to some degree, I, I, I definitely agree with that, that belief is a very personal issue. We would all agree with that. 
Um, I have uh, some of my own thoughts about that, but I'm going to let this keep going and um, see what his next two hypotheses are. And so, and you know, you could consider that a cop out, and maybe it is. And then another one was, um, well, what do you mean by believe? Like, do you mean the words? Do you mean to say the words, I believe in God? Does that indicate that you believe in God? Like, I don't know what you mean by believe exactly, because and that's got me in trouble too because you know people think that attempting to clarify the meaning of words is an attempt to escape from the question when it's actually an attempt to specify the question i mean so he just made a very interesting point um both uh relevant to this question but also outside of it anytime we're pre we're presented with a question um sometimes it's very important that we be very precise and careful with our words so that we can um, get a, a, a better sense or a better picture of really specifically what it is that is being asked of us. And so attempting to clarify and be very specific with our word choice and phrasing um, is, is not an attempt to sidestep the question, is not an attempt to escape the question, but rather it's an attempt to clarify the question so that we understand fully what it is that is being asked of us, or what it is that we are asking of others. So that, that's a very important um, point that he, he brings up. Is what you believe what you say, or what you act out? I would say to some degree it's both, but if push comes to shove, as far as I'm concerned, what you believe is what you act out, not what you say. And okay, so I know I'm stopping this a lot. Um, I will let it play through a little bit more but he makes a very important clarification or distinction is, is faith what we say, or is it what we act out, what we do, uh, how we behave? Um, now he says in some sense it's, it's both, but if push comes to shove, it has much more to do with what we actually act out in the real world. Um, and we see that all throughout scripture. When we talk about faith, I always taught um, those who are investigating the church during my time as a missionary, that faith isn't just a simple profession of uh, belief or intellectual thought or opinion. Um, faith is a verb. It's an action word. It, it's, it's that belief that has been so thoroughly ingrained into us that we have no other option but to act out that belief in the world. Um, it's to go out and do things um, with that belief. Um, that's, that's how I've always framed faith, and to, I believe that's exactly what uh, Jordan Peterson is saying in this instance as well. And then, you know, and if you're an integrated person, then what you act out and what you say are the same thing, and then you're a person whose word can be trusted, right? Because what you say and what you do are isomorphic. They're the same thing. But it, belief is instantiated in action. So I, I, I have also suggested that I act as if I believe in God, or to the best of my ability. And uh, people aren't very happy with that either. But, uh, and then the third is that I'm afraid that he might exist, which I think is the most comical of the three answers and perhaps the most accurate one. But then, but then... Think about that for a second, brothers and sisters. If you're, if you're looking at this through the lens of someone who is um, traditionally not a believer in God, um, someone like for instance, in Jordan Peterson's position, who for many of many years of his life um, did not necessarily believe in God or did not profess any belief in God, to act as if God exists because you may actually be afraid that he does. Think about what that, that kind of means there. Um, very interesting question to ask ourselves. I was thinking about this today when I was thinking about what I might talk to you guys about, and I thought, well... Let's go into this a little bit more. Um, let's say you say you do believe in God. You say, I believe in God. It's like, okay, well, that's hypothetically pretty impressive, I would say. It's like you believe that there's a divine power that oversees everything, that is fundamentally ethical, that's watching everything you do, and, um, and you believe that. And so what effect does that have on your behavior if, if you believe it? Does that mean that you're, well, are you full, are you all in? 
on your beliefs? Are you sacrificing everything to this transcendent entity that you proclaim belief in? Have you cleansed yourself of all your sin, let's say? Are you making all the sacrifices that you need to make? Like, have you taken the moat out of your eye? No. That the mere statement, let's say, or the mere acting out of the ritual, let's say, and, and I, I'm not trying to denigrate the statement or the ritual, but I'm pointing out that that's no indication of your right to say that you believe. Because you got to, and I think this is why it's bothered me to answer this question. It's like, well, what right do I have to say that, to make that claim? I believe in God. Well, what's the claim? Is that the claim that I'm a good person somehow? Because you'd think that if you believed in God... So he's making a, an important point that something that I've seen, and I know many of you have seen throughout life, is people will assume their goodness uh, by by their proclamation of belief in God. Or or they'll do the same uh, for others. They'll say, oh, well, um, you know, so-and-so, he's a, he's a good guy, you know, he believes in God. And they make that connection that to believe in God or to believe in Jesus Christ means that you are a good person. Um, so we, we tend to sometimes connect those two, which may not always be appropriate. Um, so interesting point he's making there. Actually, like, like seriously, that you'd be a good person like right now because, well, <laughs> well for obvious reasons. I would think. And so if that hasn't happened in some sort of miraculous sense, so that you're the best person you could possibly imagine being on an ongoing basis, and then terrified of, of deviating from that path in a serious manner, then I don't see why you have the right to say that you believe in God. You know, one of the things Nietzsche said about Christianity, he was a great critic of Christianity, although also a great friend in a, in a very peculiar way, um, in that Sometimes your best friend is the one who points out your weakest um, properties, let's say. He said, as far as he was concerned, there was only one Christian, and he died on the cross. And, and that's, that's a, you know, perhaps an extreme statement, but one worth giving some consideration to. It's like, well, then you look at what are, what are you called upon, let's say, if you're going to proclaim yourself as a believer, you know? And, and I thought about this a lot. As I've gone through the Old Testament, I did a bunch of lectures last year. And so what are you called upon? Well, you're called upon initially to act out the spark of divinity that's within you by confronting potential with the logos that's within you, which means to take the opportunities that are in front of you, the potential future, and to transform it into the present in the best possible way using truth and courage and careful articulation as your, as, your, as, your, as, your, as your guide. So that's the first thing you're called on to do. That, that's a major deal there. That's a tough one. And then... And we are called on to do that. That is the fundamental call of every believer, is to come out of Babylon. It's to cleanse the inner vessel. It's to uh, have a have the humility to recognize our nothingness before God and to come before him and offer up ourselves to him and his service. That's the fundamental initial calling of what it means to be a believer. And the second is to make the proper sacrifices. That's the Cain and Abel story. It's like you, you want something, you genuinely want it, you want to set the world straight, then you let go of what's necessary and you pursue you let go of what isn't necessary, no matter what it is, no matter what it is. And then you pursue what's necessary, and then maybe you sacrifice your children to God. That, that was the story. Um, that's the, one of the next stories that comes up, of course, and you think, well, that's pretty damn barbaric. And Talking about the out, sacrifice of, of Isaac. It is, but, um, that isn't exactly what it means. It means that what you try to do when you raise children is that you try to do everything you can to impress upon them by imitation and by instruction and by love and by encouragement that they are crucial beings in the world whose ethical decisions play an important role in shaping the structure of reality itself and that they have the moral responsibility to do that. And so he, he's making the 
um, the the claim here of the the story of Abraham sac- sacrificing Isaac, um, and he's giving the kind of allegorical and metaphorical um, uh, reasons for that, um, while kind of sidestepping what most Christians today and and uh, Jews today believe to be the actual historical account. We, we believe the historicity of this account of Abraham and Isaac, that it wasn't just a, a story, but that it actually happened. Um, and it happened in the manner that we believe it happened, that it was written in Genesis to have happened. And so he kind of sidesteps that and goes straight for uh, what he believes to be the uh, transcendent meaning within the story. You get your ark in order, that's your family, let's say, so that when the storms come, you can stay above water for the 40 days of flooding, and you're capable of leading your people through the desert when the desert makes itself manifest, and you can escape from tyranny properly because you're wise enough to see it, and you take the full burden of being on yourself, all the suffering that's, that's part and parcel of that, you accept that voluntarily, let's say, and you do everything you can to confront the malevolence that's part of you and that's part of the state and that's part of the world. And you, you, you make a garden around you. That's the paradise, a walled garden. It's a walled, well-watered place, so the forces of nature and society exist together in harmony, and you place your family in that so that they can live properly. And you treat your enemy as if he's yourself, and the same with your brother. And, well, then you can say, then maybe you can say, maybe then you have the right to say that you believe in God. Otherwise, maybe you should think twice about it. Not all those who say, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Got that about right? Which means something approximating just because you make a claim to moral virtue, let's say, your belief in God, which I, th- I, I can't see the, the, how you can make a higher claim to moral virtue than that. You know, I mean, agnostic, atheistic, I, I don't really care. The, the, the purpose, the point is something like this. Imagine something of ultimate transcendent value. I don't care whether you believe in it or not, but imagine that something like that exists, and then you swear allegiance to it, which is to say, I believe in this, I mean, there's a heavy moral burden that comes along with that just to allow yourself to utter the words without feeling that you should be immediately struck down appropriately by lightning. And so, well, and so I think that's why that question makes me uncomfortable. It's that I don't think I have a, I don't think I have a right to make that proclamation. There's another thing, too, that I learned when I was going through these biblical lectures. It was a fascinating thing to do. Okay, so I'm going to stop his video here. Um, This is a full hour and 45-minute lecture. But I I just wanted to take a few minutes here to share a little bit about um, uh, Jordan Peterson's um, model of faith or, or belief and what it means to be a believer. Um, and I think he makes some very important points about the, the weight of what it really means to believe um, and how we act out that belief in the world. And there's some very important questions that he asks that um, frankly need to be answered by every one of us. Um, so I want to go now to um, a conference talk. This is from Elder David A. Bednar from 2012 um, from his talk entitled The Powers of Heaven. Um, And this is a story, I'm not going to share the whole talk, but this is a story that he gave um, during this talk that kind of highlights some of the same things or similar things that Jordan Peterson is hinting at. And and, and I kind of want to dive into this a little bit. I was reared in a home with a faithful mother and a wonderful father. My mom was a descendant of pioneers who sacrificed everything for the church and kingdom of God. My dad was not a member of our church and, as a young man, had desired to become a Catholic priest. Ultimately, he elected not to attend theological seminary and instead pursued a career as a tool and die maker. For much of his married life, 
my father attended meetings of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints with our family. In fact, just a quick note on that. Um, for any of you who um, belong to families where, um, where e either your spouse or, or somebody in your family is not a member of the church, to spend their life attending church meetings together as a family um, is an act of faith uh, and an act of goodwill. Um, having spent my time on my mission serving many families who were what we, what we would consider to be um, part member families, where one spouse was a member of the church and the other wasn't, um, or, or where maybe um, some of the kids were but the parents weren't, um, and, and vice versa. Um, I want to take a second and recognize the sacrifice and um, the, the faith and, and, and um, beauty that it is to uh, continue to support those within your family who um, are uh, members of the church, or wh whether it's our church or another faith, um, but to support those who um, wholeheartedly have a belief and wish to enact that, that, that belief in the world in attending their church meetings and um, going, you know, quote-unquote, all in, um, in their belief. To have a, a spouse or someone in the family who is not a member of that faith be supportive um, is um, incredibly difficult sometimes. And um, the, the fact that so many of you and, and so, many, so many out there um, who are not members of the church but support their family who are, and maybe even attend meetings with them, um, takes a, a great deal of faith and trust and love uh, and support to do that. So that, that's a very important, um, very important thing um, that should not go overlooked. Many of the people in our ward had no idea that my dad was not a member of the church. He played on and coached our ward softball team helped with scout activities, and supported my mother in her various callings and responsibilities. I want to tell you about one of the great lessons I learned from my father about priesthood authority and power. As a boy, I asked my dad many times each week when he was going to be baptized. He responded lovingly but firmly each time I pestered him. David. I am not going to join the church for your mother, for you, or for anyone else. I will join the church when I know it is the right thing to do. I believe I was in my early teenage years when the following conversation occurred with my father. We had just returned home from attending our Sunday meetings together, and I asked my dad when he was going to be baptized. He smiled and said, David, you are the one always asking me about being baptized. Today, I have a question for you. I quickly and excitedly concluded that now we were making progress. My dad continued, Dave, your church teaches that the priesthood was taken from the earth anciently and has been restored by heavenly messengers to the prophet Joseph Smith, right? I replied that his statement was correct. Then he said, here is my question. Each week in priesthood meeting, I listen to the bishop and the other priesthood leaders remind, beg, and plead with the men to do their home teaching and to perform their priesthood duties. If your church truly has the restored priesthood of God, why are so many of the men in your church no different about doing their religious duty than the men in my church. Okay, that is the big question. If we in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints treat our religious responsibilities um, as lightly as we might treat our other daily activities or as lightly as other members of other faiths treat their religious duties, then what claim do we have within ourselves to be partakers of and holders of the true priesthood of God. Um, 
Now, there, there are some issues with the phrasing of this question um, that Elder Bednar might touch on here, but um, ultimately the, the question is a valid one. Uh, at, it, at its core, what it's asking is a valid question that each of us need to answer. My young mind immediately went completely blank. I had no adequate answer for my dad. Now, brethren, I believe my father was wrong to judge the validity of our Church's claim to divine authority by the shortcomings of the men with whom he associated in our ward. And this is exactly the point I was making in my previous video um, about sustaining fallible prophets. Um, the, the argument between, uh, or the difference between the validity of the claim of priesthood authority and priesthood keys and power versus the shortcomings of the men who hold those offices. Um, we cannot judge them as the same thing, but rather um, two sides of the same coin that go hand in hand. Um, and to, to claim that uh, because of the shortcomings of the individuals, that it invalidates the claim of authority uh, is an incorrect assumption. But embedded in his question to me was a correct assumption that men who bear God's holy priesthood should be different from other men. Men who hold the priesthood are not inherently better than other men, but they should act differently. Men who hold the priesthood should not only receive priesthood authority, but also become worthy and faithful conduits of God's power. Be ye clean that bear the vessels of the Lord. I have never forgotten the lessons about priesthood, authority, and power I learned from my father. A good man, not of our faith, who expected more from men who claimed to bear God's priesthood. That Sunday afternoon conversation with my dad many years ago produced in me a desire to be a good boy. I did not want to be a poor example and a stumbling block to my father's progress in learning about the restored gospel. I simply wanted to be a good boy. So some very important questions that we need to ask ourselves. Um, and it, this all really culminates into the weight of belief. What does it mean to believe? What does it mean to have faith in Christ? What does that actually look like in our daily lives? I want to go over here um, to a few different scriptures. So this is uh, Ether chapter 12, verse 6. Uh, it says, And now I, Moroni, would speak somewhat concerning these things. I would show unto the world that faith is things which are hoped for and not seen. Wherefore, dispute not, because ye see not. For ye receive no witness until after the trial of your faith. So, we have both the definition of faith, um, or at least a partial definition of faith, as well as a declaration of um, a declaration of the action of faith. And we so we, so we have um, I, what I think is Moroni basically describing what faith is, similar to what we see in the New Testament uh, in the writings of Paul. Um, but we have this second part here, um, which is kind of a charge, um, to those who claim a lack of faith or a lack of, uh, witness, um, dispute not because you see not for you receive no witness until after the trial of your faith. Um, this is something that many of us struggle with in our faith journey. Um, there are certain aspects of the gospel of Jesus Christ that we may cling to um, very easily and, and right away in our faith journey. Um, the love and mercy of God, um, despite our personal shortcomings and weaknesses. Um, there are certain doctrines of the gospel that we may cling to and, and fully believe um, and then there are others that may take some time and, and some effort to really learn and study it out and have confirmed to us by the Holy Spirit. 
Um, and so w- an important aspect of our um, faith journey um, is to not um, give in to our self-doubts, not give in to a... Um, not not give place for us to doubt the validity of the claims of the doctrines and principles of the gospel of Jesus Christ um, based on our lack of a witness, right? We must have a trial of faith before we receive the witness. Um, there are several verses down here as well um, that Moroni uses to further explain this point that I think are relevant um, let's see. So if I just continue on through with verse seven, it says, for it was by faith that Christ showed himself unto our fathers after he had risen from the dead. And he showed not himself unto them until after they had faith in him. Wherefore, it must needs be that some had some had faith in him, for he showed himself not unto the world. So he didn't show himself to everybody, but he did show himself to those who had faith. But because of the faith of men, he has shown himself unto the world and glorified the name of the father and prepared a way that thereby others might be partakers of the heavenly gift which uh, I would say is the atonement of Jesus Christ and the ability to be reconciled unto God, that they might hope for those things which they have not seen. Wherefore, ye may also have hope and be partakers of the gift if ye will but have faith. So there it is again. We must exercise faith before we can be partakers of the gift. Behold, it was by faith that they of old were called after the holy order of God, the priesthood, It was by faith that we are called to the priesthood. Wherefore, by faith was the law of Moses given. But in the gift of his son hath God prepared a more excellent way, the higher law. And it is by faith that it hath been fulfilled. For if there be no faith among the children of men, God can do no miracle among them. Wherefore, he showed not himself until after their faith. This is such an important uh, aspect to this concept of faith. God can do no miracle among the unbelieving. And even if he were to do a miracle in front of the unbelieving, because of their unbelief, they will not recognize the miracle. That was the problem with many of the people in the time of Jesus and the apostles. We read uh, the scripture in my previous video, um, about sustaining fallible uh, prophets, this the story of uh, Jesus when he was in his own country and preaching to his own people and trying to teach them and trying to perform miracles and, and um, do things for them, and they didn't take him seriously. Um, they were unbelieving, and because of their unbelief, he wasn't able to do many miracles for them. So what does it mean to believe, and and what does that mean to act out that belief and that faith in our daily lives and in in our life? Um, This is John chapter 14 in the New Testament. Um, I'm just going to read a couple verses here that I think are incredibly important um, that touch on this, this point or answer this point. This is the Savior speaking. He says, Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me. Or else believe me for the very work's sake. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. And greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. So here in verse 12, particularly, we have the words of the Savior, the, the, the promise and the charge that whoever believes in Christ 
the works that he does, we should do also. And greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. That's the charge that we're under. If we truly believe in Christ, then we are to do the works of Christ. We are to enact Christ in our life and in the lives of those around us. In everything we do, we are meant to be a witness for God. Right? That is, um, that is Mosiah chapter 18, when the people of Alma are being baptized. You know, uh, are you willing to mourn with those that mourn? Are you willing to be a witness for God in all things and in all places and in all ways, even until death? Everything you do is meant to hold up Christ or hold up the image of Christ um, enacted in your life. That's that charge. And that's the charge that is made as part and parcel of the covenants we make uh, at baptism and in every single covenant after. So we have this charge from the Savior. What does that look like? We have, after the Savior came to uh, the people in the Americas um, in Third Nephi, he ordained his 12 disciples. Um, he taught them the correct principles of the gospel. He, he taught them the doctrines of Christ, um, all these important things. And we read here in Fourth Nephi um, about the following generations of people. There were several generations of this people who are so righteous because they had fully embraced the teachings of the Savior uh, when he came to them. And in first or in, in fourth Nephi, um, chapter one, verse five, um, this is what it says. And there were great and marvelous works wrought by the disciples of Jesus insomuch that they did heal the sick and raise the dead and cause the lame to walk and the blind to receive their sight and the deaf to hear and all manner of miracles did they work among the children of men and in nothing did they work miracles save it were in the name of Jesus. If as disciples of the Savior we are charged with doing his works and walking his walk doing the things that he did. This is what that looks like. Great and marvelous works are wrought by the disciples of Jesus Christ, in so much that they did heal the sick and raise the dead, and so on and so on. And all manner of miracles did they work among the children of men, and did in nothing did they work miracles, save it were in the name of the Savior. So, Going back to the point made by Moroni in Ether chapter 12, we can do no miracle or there can be no miracle performed until after the trial of our faith. We must exercise that belief, the, the intellectual or, or spiritual witness of the Savior and his gospel. We must act that out into our lives by performing the very acts that Jesus would perform were he in our shoes. That's what we constantly fall short of as individuals. So while I, I disagree to some degree with Jordan Peterson's um, very, um, very, very strict view of uh, when it's appropriate to claim belief, um, I, I do believe that he hits on something very, very important. Uh, both he and, and Elder Bednar hit on this, this problem of the weight of belief, what it truly means to believe and how we must have the humility and, um, and we must, um, sacrifice and be obedient unto the commandments of God. If we're truly going to enact out that belief in the world to simply just say that you believe really doesn't mean anything. How many people do you and I know who profess a belief in something, but they don't act that out in their life? And of course, we can be very judgmental and critical in pointing out those flaws and, and the disparity between what they say and what they do. And the same can be done to us. But nevertheless, the question has to be asked, how much do we really believe? And I would say that how much we really believe is made apparent in how much we enact out in our life.
and the fact that many of us today fail to recognize the miracles or fail to enact these miracles. And it doesn't have to be raising people from the dead necessarily, but it it does need to be the, the miracles that we need to perform in our daily lives don't have to be raising people from the dead. Um, you know, that, that level, it doesn't have to be parting the Red Sea level, um, in our daily life, but it does need to be uplifting others, caring for others, um, enacting charity. Um, and, and making room in our heart for the savior to perform the miracles that we do need in our life. And, being willing to ask in prayer for the guidance and for the knowledge and light and understanding that we need to receive those miracles. President Nelson has said several times and has reaffirmed in this most previous, gen- most recent general conference, the Lord will do the most, uh, m- most wonderful miracles will be wrought by the Savior between now and his coming. The contingency is that we must be faithful. These miracles will not occur or will not be visible to those who do not exercise faith. And so if we're going to be true disciples of Christ, we need to be not only believing, but we need to go out and do and perform those miracles and be willing to have the Lord perform those miracles in our lives and the lives of others. That's really the weight of, of belief, what it means to truly believe. And the fact that so many of us walk through life, even members of the church, walk through our lives um, not seeing the miracles and not taking part of the miracles is a referendum on us and our faith and our unbelief. So I want to end here, um, not super long today, But something that I felt was very important as we get closer and closer to the Lord's coming, to his second coming, um, we know there are going to be very many trying times. There's going to be a lot of tribulations and things that will occur in our own lives personally and at at a local level, a community level, and a global level. Things that will test and try our faith. And if we're not actively putting the work and effort into strengthening our testimony of the Savior— and strengthening our faith in him and acting that out in our lives, then we will be unprepared to meet those tribulations and those trials and to come out on top um, faithful. And so this seems to be, at least in my estimation, um, the greatest um, call of action to every disciple to every member of the Lord's restored church is to come out of Babylon and do what we need to put away everything else that is not necessary or that is a hindrance to our faith and our faith journey. Put those things aside and focus and be all in on the service of the Lord and strengthening our faith in him. And in so doing, we can be promised to have the blessings that we need and the miracles that we need in our own lives to get us through to the millennium and to the celestial kingdom ultimately. I want to thank all of you for taking the time to listen to this podcast today. Um, This has been a really enjoyable one. I, uh, this is the first time I've ever done uh, full video clips on this podcast, so I hope it works out and I don't get any copyright strikes or anything. Um, So we'll see how that goes. But um, uh, I felt like this was an important topic to tackle and much, much more can be said on this topic. I just wanted to kind of get into it a little bit um, as I, I've, I have been feeling a lot lately that this is the message of President Nelson and the First Presidency in the Quorum of the Twelve lately is strengthening our testimony. And what does that really mean? What does that really look like? And so this was kind of my attempt to sort of get into that in, in answering that question, at least to some degree. degree. 
So thank you all for listening. If you're new to the channel, uh, again, please consider subscribing to the channel. Um, like this video if you like the video. And also, uh, don't be afraid to share the podcast with others. Um, that's how we grow the community, and that's how we help others to uplift others and to um, spread the message of faith in Christ with others um, preparatory to his second coming. And so with that, I will see you guys in the next video.